Hello and welcome to the Daily News Simplified. Today we have taken up the Delhi edition of The Hindu as well as The Indian Express dated 13th of January 2024 and we have identified these news articles for you for today's discussion. As you can see five articles will be dealt mainly from the perspective of prelims examination. Government is now going to uh, carry out mass vaccination against human papilloma virus and so it is important for us to understand and in the past UPSC has asked every year question especially on viral disease there has been question on hepatitis B there has been question on Zika virus so next important article is Akash missile because uh, DRDO has conducted successful test uh, from Chandipur uh, integrated uh, missile testing range in Odisha and so that is why we are going to look into that also, UPSC frequently questions us on our understanding of defense equipments. There has been a question on Prithvi missile, Agni missile, also on intercontinental ballistic missile, cruise missile and all such matters. India has seen record production of pulses as according to the recent release by the ministry. And so we are going to look into some basic statistics of pulses, why pulses are so important apart from the fact that we might like them because they are a major source of protein. There has been some issues in 30 meter uh, telescope project which has been situated in Hawaii and the good thing is that India has been participating in this international venture and so Indian delegation visited that that's why it is in news. Water bird census has re uh, revealed that in Kaziranga there is almost one third increase in the visiting migratory birds during the winter season. And so we know that from the perspective of environment, it is important for us to cover that. When it comes to the main section, there are three very, very important articles which directly relate with various topics in GS paper 1, GS paper 2 and GS paper 3. For example, coastal areas, issues and solutions. NGT has asked all the coastal areas and union territories to come up with a coastal management plan and because they do not have one, especially the central government has not designed it despite notifying coastal regulatory zones 2018 utilizing EPA 1986. So we are going to look into why coastal areas are so important. Also, we are going to delve into what are the main challenges and issues that they face and what we can do to resolve the situation. Chief Minister Arvind Kejriwal, Chief Minister of Delhi has stated that Prime Minister Narendra Modi hates slums and so he is going to demolish all the slums and give it to the private builders for redevelopment. And so that brings us to the very very important topic in GS paper 1 syllabus, urbanization and its issues. Now slums and slum formation and issues related to slum can be only observed in urban areas. So we are going to understand how slums develop, what are the issues and challenges once a slum develops uh, that are faced by the slum and also the urban areas and finally Prime Minister Modi has taken a sly uh, has uh, indirectly uh, you know stated that uh, we are above dynastic politics we have intra-party democracy and so we have utilized that small article to cover the topic related to inner party democracy because there is a line in GS paper 2 representation of the People's Act 1951 where one of the issue is that RPA does not enforces inner party democracy among the political parties. But now we have seen that especially after anti-defection law, the political parties have become the centerpiece of policy and decision making in India. And so just like we need India to be democratic, we need political parties also to be democratic without which we cannot have or achieve the aim of substantive democracy. We will end the session with just one minute discussion on key takeaway from a very, very important article written by the uh, ex-CBI director Erki Raghavan who uh, talks about the recent uh, DGP summit that was held and what are the main issues about police reforms that were taken up there. So let's now begin the discussion but before we uh, begin the discussion obviously this is an honest request for all of you to please press the like button and also let us know what you feel about our initiative and if you want to be updated and uh, be informed about our uh, videos please press the bell icon. All right, let's now begin the discussion. First article that we have taken is human papilloma virus because you can see that there is big article in the explained section of Indian Express which talks about the government has decided to give a push to carry out mass vaccination campaign against this very very uh, 
not so deadly but problematic virus it is problematic because it is the second most common cause of cervical cancer especially among women it is also problematic because it uh, transmits from one person to another through direct skin to skin contact also unlike hiv and hepatitis b which requires intimate sexual inter uh, exchange of bodily fluids if you really want to understand why we have taken up this particular article you can look at previous year question 2017 when zika was in news a question was asked on zika that it is a virus which is transmitted by so mode of transmission is very important to be understood for all the important viral and bacterial infectious diseases so you can see that the answer was both 1 and 2 let's now first understand what you have to remember and that is more than sufficient you have to remember that it is just not one virus just like most of the just like hiv is not a one strain there are two three four common commonly infecting strains of viruses and in case of human papilloma virus there are more than 200 varieties of viruses but not all of them are a cause of concern very few out of these 200 are cause for concern it is primarily transmitted through intimate skin to skin contact what happens is that when a person gets infected because of human papilloma virus most of the people never actually develop any kind of symptom and they live their life happily ever after but only in some people only in some immune compromised people that human papilloma virus uh, starts showing symptoms in form of warts or what we in hindi called papulas or like a uh, pimples and now these pimples a yellow portion of the pimple which is usually called as pus contains a lot of human papilloma virus and when you come in direct skin contact with the person who is showing the symptoms that's when the transmission takes place and it specifically infects women and most of the women who have developed cervical cancer were also found to be positive hpv or infected with human papilloma virus that brings us to the first practice question consider the following statements regarding human papilloma virus human papilloma virus is primarily transmitted through direct physical contact obviously you can see the answer on the left side that's why we make you practice so that at the same time you also remember the answer human papilloma virus infection is a major cause of cervical cancer obviously this statement is also correct and human papilloma virus vaccine is recommended only for females this is obviously incorrect leading us to the right answer b only two it is recommended for all the people of almost all the ages but it is restricted to not more than 45 years of age you can find this in the pdf next news article is important because akash missile forms an integral part of india's uh, defense system it is a surface to air missile and as you can see that it uh, was yesterday tested from chandipur so another important aspect is chandipur which is the integrated test range from where drdo carries out most of the test fires of all the missiles that they develop and also the missiles that they import they are tested there just this prelims UPSC tested us on our understanding of difference between ballistic and cruise missile as you can see ballistic missiles are jet propelled at subsonic speeds throughout their flights while cruise missiles are rocket powered only in the initial phase of flight this is obviously incorrect now let us know in the comment section why because of which portion of this statement this is incorrect agni 5 is a medium range supersonic cruise missile while brahmos is solid fueled intercontinental ballistic missile so what we can take away from this previous year question is you should know clearly about a particular missile is a uh, surface to air missile or air to air missile or water to air water to surface missile you should know how many stages does it have whether it is solid fueled or whether it is a liquid fueled whether it is a cruise or a ballistic missile so that should be absolutely clear when it comes to the akash missile it is a short range range of not more than 25 to 40 kilometers surface to air missile so as you can see in this demonstration this is chandipur and from there multiple akash rockets were shot to intercept multiple intruders so 
this missile has been created to protect india to defend india against an attack by a contingent of more than uh, one plane entering into india's airspace at the same time and so you can see that it is indigenously designed as well as developed by drto and just the image will let you know that it can target multiple objects at the same time so it's not like one missile will distribute into four to target but the launcher can launch multiple uh, multiple shots can it can fire multiple shots within a split second to take care of it set let's say there are multiple intruders entering into india's airspace when it comes to propellant it is solid fuel with reference to akash missile systems which of the following statement is are correct it is a long range surface to air missile you can see it is not a long range it is a short range it is incorrect it is fueled by solid fuel engine obviously you can see it is solid fuel it is indigenously designed as well as developed by drdo both are correct so marking taking us to the right answer only two next article is about pulses and pulses have become the mainframe mainstay of our response to the malnutrition problem because uh, pulses you can see how important this news article is that Hindu as well as Indian Express gave it a coverage and that too a very important one prominently appearing in both the newspapers lentil production set to touch all time high consumer secretary focus on best practices as global meat on pulses return to India now you can see that in 2020 the question has been asked on pulse production and not because of that but because of the growing importance of pulses we have taken this so let's now understand what you have to remember first and foremost pulses are obviously important because they are a chief source of protein because as compared to let's say rice where the protein portion is less than 7 to 8 percent which means if you consume 100 gram of rice you might get depending upon which variety 5 to 10 grams of protein if you similarly consume wheat the ratio is going to be less than 12 to 13 grams per 100 gram of wheat but almost all the pulses give you per 100 gram 20 to 25 gram protein some non-vegetarian diets provide you some uh, more quantity of protein but then at the same time non-vegetarian diet is also very expensive and so if you want to elevate indian children out of uh, stunting and wasting multi-generational malnutrition then you have to focus on pulses the problem is that the production of pulses declined in 60 1780s because of the green revolution too where the minimum support prices msp program did not focus upon pulse and pulse related acquisition by fci we just focused on removing hunger nutrition was not a concern for us very recently in last one or two decades we have included pulses and that's when we have uh, started focusing on diversification apart from just the health element it is also important from another reason because it is also an element of the agriculture crop cycle which is what makes agriculture sustainable because every cycle of agriculture depletes the soil of very essential nitrogen nitrogen is otherwise 78 percent in the atmosphere but there is no mechanism which can directly uh, put that nitrogen air n2 into the soil and what facilitates this is a beautiful symbiosis or mutual cooperation between leguminous plants which means the pulse plant and some set of nitrogen fixation bacteria which live in association with these leguminous plants and that's when when one si one crop of non-leguminous is interspaced with one leguminous plant while they give us pulses in the process they also restore the nitrogen in the soil and that's why they are so important the pulses contribute to healthy soils also nitrogen oxides nox varying combination of nitrogen and oxygen they have a very very high global warming potential and so the leguminous plant by restoring the nitrogen by converting different nitrogen oxides into ammonia and then finally some combination of urea into the soil does the job of reduction in uh, global warming as well india is the largest producer as well as the consumer of the pulses because of that 
because we produce less than what we need we also import we have to import the pulses and that's where this particular news is extremely heartening because by increasing the pulses production we can reduce the amount of imports and save a lot of foreign exchange reserves when it comes to the overall cultivation uh, pulses account for around 20 percent of the area under food grains and contribute around 7 to 10 percent of the total food grain production in the country so this information should be more than sufficient for you uh, as far as um, pulses are concerned especially at the prelims level with reference to the pulse production in India consider the following statements Kharif season accounts for a majority of the total pulses production black gram alone accounts for more than half of the pulse production production of pulses in India has continuously increased since last decade now all the three statements all three statements are absolutely incorrect this is something which you will find out when you will download the PDF. The Kharif season does not account for majority of total pulse production. Black gram does not account for half of the pulse production. And the pulse production in India has not increased since last decade. Next and second last prelims article, 30 meter telescope. What you see in the image I would like to clarify first is not the real image it's not the real image because it is not functional in fact the construction of the 30 meter telescope has not begun yet because the plan was to start the world's largest optical and infrared telescope at this particular location in hawaii island hawaii is a state of united states of america as you can see this is us this is Russia and thousands of kilometers away from both the coast is the chain of small islands of Hawaii and on that uh, very near to Mauna Kea Peak which is uh, abandoned which is a volcano which has not been functional for many thousands of years is that the new location of the latest telescope. Just the fun fact most of the largest telescopes are already located in the Hawaii Islands. All the telescopes which are very very important uh, for the dis discovery of latest universal celestial phenomena are located in this range. The question is why? And the answer is very simple. If you really want to uh, observe even the faintest, most lightest of the light wave traveling from across the world, you would want to situate yourself away from dense population. Because the dense population and environmental pollution damages the faint waves. And that's the reason that when you are in urban towns like Delhi, like Chennai, Kolkata, uh, Mumbai, you really can't see the Milky Way, you really can't see the stars. As long as you go into deep forest of Western Ghats, you go into Ladakh, you start clearly seeing lakhs and lakhs of stars because of the optical pollution. And that's why most of the largest observatories which are dependent on optical light, which are dependent on infrared, happen to be situated farthest and most remote place of the world which is situated right in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Coming back to this telescope, if this is constructed, this would be the largest optical telescope and the name itself suggests that the radius of the combination of mirrors is going to be 30 meters. Now it is very very difficult to create a mirror with a radius or a diameter of 60 meters. And so what they planned was that instead of creating one large mirror, we can use a combination of 492 individual mirrors which will be smaller. And they will be placed in such a manner that they will create a larger mirror with a single focus. So it's like the multiple hexagons can be combined to result. And these are the small, small 492 mirrors that have been, that was planned. But because of the large size, the local population has protested its construction and that's why although the plan was proposed more than a 10 years ago, it has still not started the construction. It is the world's most advanced and capable ground-based optical and infrared observatory. It is a joint effort of Canada, China, Japan, USA and India. And that's why Indian delegation has visited it to identify the reasons why it is being delayed. The study of exoplanets and whether their atmosphere contain water vapor or methane 
and to study the black holes evolution of galaxies dark matter and dark energy so you can see that by creating a very very large mirror by combining 492 smaller mirror, mirrors uh, it tries to magnify even the faintest of the optical uh, light rays that the currently available larger observatories are not able to detect Consider the following statements with reference to the 30 meter telescope project. TMT is an international project aimed at building a group of 30 telescopes. Obviously, this data is incorrect. India is also a party to the TMT project. Now, this is the correct statement leading us to the right answer B, 1, uh, 2 only. Last news article from the perspective of prelims examination happens to be a very interesting one and also important because the latest water bird the birds which can fly which usually fly but they try to float on water are called water birds and so india this is the fifth time that the water bird survey has been conducted and latest census data reveals that india has seen 27 percent increase in the population of the water birds in kaziranga why this could be important is because in 2020 UPSC asked with reference to India's biodiversity. Ceylon frogmouth, copper smith barbet, grey chinned minivet, and white throated uh, red start are birds, primates, reptiles, and amphibians. Now, what we are going to tell you in this particular discussion is obviously about the water bird senses. But before that, let's have a look at the four images, the four new birds that have been found that have been found in the latest census, and they could be framed as a statement. So, if you happen to come across any of the options as great crested grab, greater's cop, bear's poacher, and cotton pygmy goose, all these are water birds. And why they are important? Because today's news article talks about these birds which have been identified by the water bird census which is conducted by asian water bird uh, so it is an asian water bird census which is a part of global water bird census uh, it is led by citizen science program and it is coordinated globally by wetland international wetland international is an important uh, non governmental organization which totally focuses on wetland conservation and it takes place every january in India because it is believed that that's the time when most of the migratory birds tend to visit our country. With reference to Indian biodiversity, bears pochard, great scop, great crested grebe, cotton pygmy goose are, you know the answer now. Alright, so with this we have come to the end of the prelims section discussion and this is the time when we will be taking up three very very important topics uh, from the perspective of mains examination so let's now begin the discussion with the first very very important article which talks about ngt's order or not an order because it cannot order but generally they order which is not binding on the government but they have asked uh, national ngt has asked the ministry of environment forest and climate change that coastal states and Indian uh, in Union territories should prepare a coastal zone management plan because of the increasing coastal erosion and coastal degradation. Right? If you look at two very specific lines in the syllabus of GS Paper 1 and GS Paper 3, let us know in the chat box what are those lines under which this particular topic, importance, challenges and steps for coastal ecosystems could be tested. In GS paper 1, you have a line which says changes in the geophysical phenomena. Coasts are a geophysical phenomena. They are a creation of a very, very particular, they are a result of not only plate tectonics, but they are also a result of interaction of seawater with the land. In GS paper 3, you have ecosystem conservation and environment degradation as a part of your syllabus and also disaster and disaster management. And the beauty is that the coasts in India are being impacted because of multiple reasons, which we'll come in, a, in, in three to four minutes from now. But before that, it is important for us to understand why do we so much care about the coastal areas and the people from Mumbai, Chennai should not be offended. It is a general, generally when we do not have the exposure of coast, 
we do not understand the importance of post and once we will discuss it in the next 3 to 4 year 4 minutes we will have a clear understanding as to why coasters coasts are important coasts are important because of the very very high population density and multiple urban and many important urban centers located in these areas so not only the population density is very high in these regions but also just give me one minute to change the it's a very high population density but also one of the most important towns that we have in our country are located like chennai mumbai kolkata vishakha patnam so you can see that starting from gujarat and ending in west bengal we have so so many uh, important towns mega uh, urban centers located around both east as well as the west coast of our country population generally because of the hospitable terrain because of the moderate temperatures because of generally the fertile soil which is present attracts to begin with population but it's the economic importance of the coast that there is no surprise that all the countries which start to grow they grow from coastal areas towards the hinterland and what is the reason the reason is very simple uh, if for example uh, when we generally talk about let's say india's coastal areas most of the biggest industrial production centers are located along the coastal regions which mainly come in gujarat maharashtra gujarat maharashtra karnataka and in some cases kerala but kerala is mainly mainly tourist centric apart from that when you look at the resources that they have to offer and if we just count the diversity of the resources that the coast and coastal areas offer to us you will be surprised so for example if we just keep ourselves limited to energy you might ask that there is a set of non renewable energy and there is a set of renewable energy when it comes to non renewable energy you could have uh, shale gas you could have oil and obviously you could have uh, for example methane hydrates all of them in india have been found across the coast so for example what comes as oil and shale is mainly found in uh, kg basin recently we have found the methane hydrates also so that is just the non renewable energy part when it comes to renewable energy they are ex because there is no resistance to the wind they happen to be the best locations where wind energy can be harnessed and because most of the coastal areas in our country comes in a zone which uh, generally has good sunlight they also have become the good areas to harness the solar energy also but resource one component is the energy uh, another component of resource is minerals so where do you find monazite uh, which uh, has the capability of the resource which can we can utilize to harness the radioactivity for our energy or electricity production it is the monazite sands which are found in the kerala's coast uh here it is the coastal area apart from that we have found multiple placer deposit deposits of titanium gold placer deposits there is this deposits which were uh, which were a result of sedimentary process of magnification have been found in india's coast so you can see that when it comes to resources you have a wide set of resources also including food resource so when it comes to the fishery production aquaculture all of it comes mainly from the coastal areas we have mainly two sets of uh, natural tourist destination in our country one is the set of mountains that we have in form of himalayas and western ghats another set is the beautiful beaches that we have all of them are either located in andaman or in the east and west coast or in lakshadweep which the government has recently tried to promote also because of the flat land and generally the kind of land which is very very uh, you know uh, easy to irrigate they are also one of the most fertile regions of our country because ultimately the river water goes to meet the sun uh, goes to meet the ocean forms the delta and then that water can be diverted to easily irrigate the land also the salt production that we have in our country 
and the stand that we require for our infrastructure construction for our infrastructure development comes from the coastal areas another set comes from mining of river beds mining of river bed becomes difficult because of environmental concerns so where does the sand is coming from it is coming from coastal areas but it's just not it the coasts are important for geopolitics because when we want to use our navy to project our power in indian ocean where do you think are the most critical uh, naval ports are located ports have to be located across the coastal areas are even more important for biodiversity because not only the shelf area which is the, from the basics of geography you understand what is the continental shelf and slope the shelf area houses corals which are probably even more biodiverse than the amazon rainforest so corals and mangroves both are housed in our coastal locations they are also important for the conservation of the coast is important for the conservation of art and heritage because they have been traditionally the locations through which india has carried out trade and commerce they also house one of the oldest living heritages of our country you can name some of them so for example mahabalipuram is a coastal location because of the deposition of sand we had actually lost that site and it was later on rediscovered we have already lost the ancient city of dwarka so if we do not protect our coast we obviously are going to compromise on our art heritage obviously biodiversity will be threatened we will not be able to project power but economically it is so hurting because most of the trade and commerce that our country carries out is through ports and ports obviously come with the coastal location but apart from that you can see not being able to preserve and conserve our coast are going to dent our resources tourism energy and obviously one of the most vulnerable populations that exist in our country exist in coastal areas it exists in coastal areas because of the challenges that our coastal areas face now what are the challenges that they face obviously it is not very very difficult to think that the set of challenges are multidimensional just like the importance is multidimensional the challenges are multidimensional because there are set of natural challenges that these location face obviously the first set of challenges that they face is the disaster challenge they are extremely extremely vulnerable to the disasters like cyclones and we know that this is generally the path of cyclones in bay of bengal although bay of bengal observes very high frequency and intensity of the cyclones but in recent past we have seen that in arabian sea also because of the global warming the earlier because of the high wind shear and low general surface temperature of arabian sea the frequency of cyclones was not, not very high now in last one to two decades what we have seen is the increasing frequency of cyclones once the cyclones come they obviously create problems also there is another set of disaster which we have faced and likely to face again is the result of plate tectonics because of earthquakes which can result in tsunami we know that there is a divergent plate boundary going right across the andaman sea whenever there will be a high high intensity earthquake it will result in displacement of huge water the water is going to travel especially to the eastern coast of our country and then the entire population is extremely extremely vulnerable to the uh, problems created by disasters so this is just one set of challenges that they face which is obviously natural and we nothing has have we nothing have much to do with it but there are set of challenges which go beyond i mean they are natural but they are not really disasters they are recurring phenomena we want that to happen which is monsoon so we know that especially in the western ghats their western ghat runs parallel to the western coast and we observe highest intensity of rainfall in this area after northeast this highest intensity of rainfall limited in the windward side of the western ghats creates the problem of flash floods so the monsoon create this
flash floods which ultimately result in erosion landslide on this side so this is not so much of problem uh, towards the eastern ghats but it is definitely a problem towards the western ghats but both the ghats face the brunt of regular sea waves now if you have ever seen visual footage or have gone to the beaches you will see that tides are so recurrent tides and the waves the continuous movement of waves and tides continuously carries out the process of deposition as well as erosion and that will be mainly decided by the direction of the wind and so when the direction of the wind changes some areas start observing the erosion and the eroded material is continuously deposited in some other portions it impacts not just the population it impacts the economy because the ports that we have built start seeing the siltation their depth decreases and because of which we cannot have the ships which are very heavy and that's why we need transshipment for port of uh, colombo because it is really deep harbor so generally the changing dynamics of exogenous uh, exogenous forces of uh, the nature uh, erosion and deposition keeps on changing the sand availability from one location to another location the problem is that the settlement was built because that was a, that area had a wide coast but because of the differing wind direction differing monsoon suddenly it will observe seeing the erosion and the population and settlement will be threatened under the problem of coastal erosion but then we have seen that due to climate change the intensity and frequency of the natural disasters have increased so we are seeing increasing super number of cycle, super cyclones and in increasing intensity of those cyclones also because of the global warming because of the ice shelf water uh, going into the sea there is an increase of mean sea level with every feet one feet is much more uh, than we can think of but with increasing mean sea level more and more urban areas in our country are going to be submerged and with every submerge we'll have to think about relocating the population which has so far lived very happily there apart from that because of the sand that we love so much for our construction requirement concrete is ultimately going to be taken out plugged out from some coast and so the increasing tendency of mining in the coastal areas is again creating a problem release so increasing tem temperature of ocean water increasing carb uh, decreasing ph has ultimately really uh, uh, manifested itself in disappearing corals as you must have read in your basics while the availability of mangroves earlier extended to the wide coastal areas now the mangroves are very limited to 7 to 8 locations across the globe across the entire 7500 uh, km of our coastline and so that is why it is extremely extremely important for us to conserve preserve and maintain the coastal ecology for that multiple steps have already been taken by the government of india as you can see on the screen the government came out with coastal regulate wait a second coastal regulation zone uh, notification 2018 what the government did is that they understood that because the coastal areas are so important we cannot disband the economic activity from coastal areas but then within the east and western coast there are some pristine environment which we have to protect so what they created they created zonation by creating crz1 crz2 crz3 and so once an area is notified as crz1 no economic activity is allowed similarly if there is a town let's say this is goa so that is either crz2 a to b you can read detail uh, pdf contains uh, the different kinds of economic activity which are allowed under different distinctions that have been created under coastal regulation zone but largely you should understand that by creating various zones across the coast uh, of our country the government has created a gradation of economic activities which are allowed and which are not allowed depending upon what is the designation of a particular coast in our country similarly incoys has come up with coastal vulnerability index 
Now, coastal vulnerability index is just a high resolution map that has been created by Inquise to raise the public awareness about the various threats facing the coastal areas. So, if, for example, the length, the height of the tide is high in a particular area or wave height is high or the coastal slope is very steep in a particular area in the coastal vulnerability, uh, vulnerability index that particular region at a local level will have a color which will be very different from another coast which does not face such threats. So there are eight to nine parameters on which INCOIS has designated the India's coast on the varying level of vulnerability so that the local people know what is the vulnerability and also that data can be taken into account for policy making. Similarly, blue flag certification, India's around 10 beaches have blue flag certification. Once a beach is recognized as blue flag, it has to meet certain expectations of standards starting from preservation, conservation and also cleanliness. And that has been done mainly to standardize the conservation uh, methods and also to raise awareness in the global community about some beaches in India that meet certain minimum level of expectation. Also, the government has started regeneration of mangroves program and integrated coastal zone management plan. All of that you can read. But just to give you a context, when it comes to the uh, western coast of our country, you can see that how much of the what is the proportion of the coast that has been eroded or degraded? So uh, you can't see the numbers over there, but you can clearly see one, two, three, four, five units, one, one point five. So out of five units, uh, or maybe five hundred kilometers of the coast that the Gujarat has, more than one fifty kilometer has seen massive erosion. So you can see that in Kerala, the amount of erosion reaches up to around fifty percent. Similarly, across eastern coast, the situation is almost the same. So, when we say that a lot of the coastal areas are observing erosion that is substantiated by data because this data has been released by National Center for Coastal Research, which comes under the Ministry of Earth Science. So, you can see it written, you can see it written down there. All right. Okay. So let's now move on to the second last article for today's discussion, which is uh, basically slums and issues. What uh, Arvind, Mr. Arvind Kejriwal has said yesterday is that PM hates slums, wants to demolish them even in harsh winter, says AAP. So this is a statement because initiative of slum redevelopment has been taken up by the central government in some localities in Delhi and that is why uh, Arvind Kejriwal had to say this but obviously that gives us opportunity. We are opportunists. We will utilize the opportunity to cover the syllabus. Urbanization, their problems and their remedies is a part of your syllabus. And so you can come from any place in our country. What you will see is that you come from a place where your city will have jhukkis and jhopdis or cherries, stalls in Mumbai, ahatas in Kolkata, bastis in various and cares in Bangalore. So the slums or the areas notified as slums or the very unhygienic, overpopulated, uh, without devoid of any infrastructure, every city in India has that one or multiple locations where the adjectives that I just used are can be associated. And the pie chart that you see tells you how what is the proportion of urban population that lives under slum or slum-like condition that is around 1.37 crore people or around 17% of the urban population. So one, at least one in out of five people in urban so you do a survey you meet five people more than one person will be living in urban areas because this is a government statistics of 2011 now the proportion of people living under slum or slum like condition has changed the question is how is it related to urbanization why are we covering it under urbanization because it is a result of urbanization why it is a problem it is a problem because if you look at the state-wise slum population as per census 2011, 
you can see that starting with Maharashtra and going up to let's say we draw the barrier of uh, Rajasthan you can see that in Maharashtra more than a uh, crore people are living under slum like conditions and this is a data from 10 years back with with the kind of urbanization and the rate of urbanization that we have seen the trends in total population and urban growth you can see that red color is the urban if we if the latest census census data comes out this population will be way more much than that also ur slum or slumification of urban landscape is problem because it is also crucial in our social justice it is so crucial in our social justice because every slum in our country does not have a mixed population as you can see that percentage of slum population how much of the slums dwellers in india belong to the scheduled caste you can see that in punjab if there are 100 people who live in slum 40 people are from scheduled caste background and that is the story almost in every most populous state of our country this is just sc so it is not like that the slums in india to the mixed population mixed representation or cosmopolitan nature of our country there is a bias and so if we really want to elevate uh, the pe people's overall situation we really have to target and do something about slums but the question is how do this how do we reach to the situation that we have reached where uh, so many people are living under slum areas first and foremost is that there is obviously we have seen that around 30 percent more than 30 percent rate of urbanization which means that every 10 years if there were 20 crore people living in let's say uh, 2011 in urban areas there will be around 27 to 28 crore people in 10 years so this 7 to 8 crore extra people just if the starting population of all the urban areas in our country was 20 crore where do, do these people are coming from to begin with urban areas generally have very high population and so a lot of the population growth is the result of in-house or local population increase but then we know that increasing migration rates a lot of the people are migrating from rural areas to urban areas and from smaller urban areas to larger urban areas and the migration happens because of both push from the rural areas and also pull towards the larger agglomerations that we have why do we have push from rural areas we have push from rural areas because of the low and declining agriculture viability because of lack of infrastructure which is lack of educational infrastructure lack of health infrastructure also because of the climate change whatever viability of agriculture that we had has now declined and it has become increasingly difficult to carry out the agriculture using the same set of resources and at the same time look at what the urban areas have to offer secondary and tertiary level jobs which are not dependent on weather so your income could be low but that is an assured income if you become a worker in a factory even if there is rainfall even if there is any kind of uh, activity natural or man-made you are going to get the salary as long as you perform and the employer hires keeps you high i mean uh, keeps you in the job and so that is the pull factor although it could be informal sector job but nonetheless it is an assured income also when it comes to uh, your concern about your uh, next generation with respect to health and education both are taken care of really well in urban environment and so because of these factors urban areas have become extremely extremely lucrative and attractive for the rural especially the bimaru rural uh, households rural households from up bihar bengal odisha rajasthan and such places the problem is that when so many people migrate to urban areas the urban planning or urban areas are not able to respond to the ever increasing population and so demand for urban housing is way much more than what the urban areas can supply so if the urban areas are constructing 1000 new flats every day or homes 
ten thousand people or five thousand people are migrating so where do these extra four thousand people are going to go they are going to go to the areas which are already crowded the areas where the rents are low why why are they going to go to the areas where the rents are low because they get mainly the informal sector job when you come from a rural background you do not have proper skills so you cannot be employed by bpo you cannot be generally employed by uh, in a high paying job so what remains what becomes a natural home to you you will go to the areas where the rents will be lower and that's why the areas to begin with which are dilapidated to begin with which have poor infrastructure are cheaper and then they are flogged by the incoming uh, or migration also there is a socio political factor that we have seen overpopulation of sc community in the slums because the housing is very much dependent on identity and indian urban areas openly discriminate so if, even if a person might have some good income to pay to live in a good environment that person will be discriminated on the basis of caste that person will be discriminated on the basis of religion on the basis of ethnicities there are so many stereotypes and so you don't have any other place except to look for an ever increasing concentration of already socially vulnerable sections of the society is generally seen in these areas so obviously weak urban planning because if you search in the constitution of india just type a word slum you will find it in the 12th schedule and 12th schedule means that it is a concern of the urban local government municipality and we have seen if even if you are exposed to the basics of the syllabus of gs paper 2 or the polity and governance foundation classes you will know that the urban governance in india faces the problem of funds functions and functionaries urban governance in india does not have funds they cannot levy tax so they are just dependent on whatever tax comes from the state government which is very low they do not have their independent functionaries and obviously they do not have much power with them so that they can carry out the planning before a particular area is populated or situated globalization has given a drastic turn into the phenomena of urbanization because what globalization has done that it has particularly created good and well paying jobs at a very very limited locations and because of the good and high well paying jobs of thousands of families that have got in good paying jobs in gurgaon in hyderabad in mumbai in bangalore there has to be an ecosystem to support like maids like drivers and where are these going uh, these people are going to go they are going to go into the slum areas also our laws that have been created they have been very slow and very late in order to respond to the glowing uh, what you what do you call as a growing slum problem that we uh, see in the uh, urban can you see me all right okay yeah so lack of legal recognition means that because they are situated in generally the areas where let's say a sewerage was passing or a nala was passing that's why you get really cheap housing because to begin with it is not regularized land once the densely population community comes up it is not legal but the government cannot do anything to remove it and so that is a legal loophole first we allowed them to settle it there and then once they have settled we are not also regularizing them the lack of legal recognition leads to their detachment from legal electricity legal water supply and legal sewerage system and that is what worsens the situation because if something does not ex ex uh, exist on paper for the government the government cannot take electricity officially the government cannot take the sewerage system cannot spend money on that area because that is invisible for the government and that is where the problem intensifies the issues that they face is so gross so for example overcrowding you can you imagine the uh, intensity of overcrowding in uh, for example mumbai the population density of dharavi which is the world famous slum or chawl center of mumbai more than 2.3 lakh people 
live there in every square kilometer so one one kilometer by one kilometer area one square kilometer area houses more than 2.5 lakh people and that is the density that we are talking about so it leads to overcrowding which obviously results in poor living conditions lack of basic amenities health deterioration why do you think these aspects would be they would be facing because there is so much of overcrowding and they do not exist on paper government cannot open schools legally government cannot open a lot of health centers because they cannot open there is no access to these facilities in these overcrowded areas there is no access to sunlight which then further accentuates the problem because there is no supply of clean water it gives rise to maximum infectious diseases waterborne infectious diseases like cholera because there is no sunlight there is no ventilation they observe the highest rates of tuberculosis in the slum areas that is what the problem is and also because there is no government regulation operating in these areas these areas tend to become very profitable industrial locations because one of the ways through which the cost can be added in the production is through what through taxes through government compliances because government does not reaches these areas the compliance compliance co cost is extremely low and so whenever you will see for example dharavi is extremely productive in terms of value addition they carry out a huge set of uh, production for the most of the micros and uh, medium scale uh, factories operate from there because they are overcrowded there is a labor supply cost of living is low labor can live there uh, without having to worry about rent and so uh, they also become a bottleneck in the larger sense because uh, first the government does not know what are the uh, production that is happening there they are out, out, outside of tax system and because of the informalization the government cannot carry out any initiative to help them grow which obviously they do not want so ultimately it leads to environment degradation and social stigma it is like a positive feedback loop to begin with the environmental conditions were very bad but because the conditions were bad because it was not legally uh, it, they were not legal colonies to begin with the government does not do anything to extend that it leads to further because there is no sewerage system most of the waste is discarded just on the surrounding because there is no uh, fresh water supply individual householders start drilling the bores depleting the groundwater and so because there is no legal electricity all the illegal in, uh, electricity has to come through wiring which then leads to maximum number of fire incidences in these areas and obviously it is associated with show social stigma because then to reveal that you come from and your res your residence is within this infamous slum is not good so you can see that it also creates legal and policy challenges it creates a legal and policy challenge because while on one hand it is accepted that they are not legal the problem is government cannot demolish because of the huge population that lives and this is mainly the migratory population which acts as the vote bank also the voting percentages among these population is extremely extremely high and that constrains the government from taking any drastic step to resolve this problem so it's not like the government has not done anything to resolve this problem so for example pradhan mantri awas yojana has a component of uh, low income group in urban areas the government has also come up with interest subsidy scheme for housing for urban poor so that even if you earn a little bit amount that enables you to pay some amount of initial money of the uh, how, uh, flat or any other land that you have construction cost then the government is going to take care of massive amount of interest that you will uh, have to pay or you are expected to pay in that particular area also the government as a sub component comes has come up with integrated housing slum development program where the government is taking care of the infrastructural development in the slum areas but we know that obviously these schemes are not bearing fruit on the ground so there is much more that needs to be done and so what is the way forward there are some viewers who regularly comment uh there are 60 to 70 people who really really work hard uh for example sagar is one of them so we would request a lot of people to come up with suggestions so that in case if 
the government is watching, they also might know what is the way forward out of this situation. Let us know in the comment section, we will pin the best comment. Inner party democracy. What is inner party democracy and why is it so important? Uh, inner party democracy is a component of how you ensure the democracy. So for example, when we left the lawmaking on our lawmakers, uh, we ensured that these lawmakers are selected, elected through a particular process, which is voting first past the post. We designed a constitution, we created an independent election commission to ensure that people who are doing the lawmaking, who are holding the executive accountable for us, are genuinely people who represent some portion of the population. But the problem is that when we did, we when we went for the political party system in a parliamentary system, we did not enforce any set of rules or guidelines as to how political parties will perform. Initially, it was not a problem. Initially, it was not a problem because political parties did not have a constitutional existence. So there was no mention of political parties initially. But then we created 52nd Constitutional Amendment, which for the first time recognized the existence of political party and bound the members of a political party from headquarters, from a high command, from the party president, which said that if the whip is issued, they have to follow that order. And suddenly we saw that the party headquarters became very, very important and powerful. And that's when we really see the problem happening. So why we are covering it? Because as you saw on the last slide, representation of the People's Act is a part of your syllabus under GS Paper 2. And part of the problem is Section 29 of RPA 1951 in India which says that every party needs to have a constitution. In that constitution, they have to write down that they pay respect to the Indian constitution, they want secularism, they are not going to go against, uh, they are not going to talk about uh, anything which deters India's sovereignty and integrity, but, and they are also going to write in that constitution how they are going to select, elect or nominate their party office holders. How that process will be done is not mandated on political parties and that is what the problem is and as we know that anti-defection law has made the political parties and hence the headquarters very powerful so it's like power has shifted outside from the parliament into the confines of uh, party headquarters the problem is that the lack of inner party democracy which means that there is no particular way as to how office office holders will be elected. So if there are 20 main parties, there are 20 ways to select or elect or even in most cases nominate. So recently you must have seen Mayavati has nominated uh, her nephew. And similarly, Mamta Banerjee, hair and, hair and successor is also her nephew. So they, they just, they don't have to get that person elected. So what it means, is how the office holders will be chosen, how the party program will be decided, party agenda, how who will set the agenda, the distribution of tickets or the decision on who will be the party candidates in various constituencies is not determined by law or a particular way is not enforced in the on the political parties. What it creates is that it has created the problem of centralization of power. A political party might have 10 crore members, but then there are only five people who are calling the shots and it is the top to bottom approach. Whatever is decided at the top has to be enforced as it, as it is to the bottom. It has resulted into creation of personality cult, hero worship, because of the centralization of power, we have people who have risen above and beyond the rule of law and whatever they say becomes the law for the party members with or without the consent of the party. More often than not, in most parties, it translates into dynastic politics. One person holding party office as a president for 20-30 years and then it is transmitted to their children for next 20-30 years. Although parties do not emerge like that, but eventually one person controls, starts controlling all the party management and then that person calls all the shots. It results into poor governance also. It results into poor governance because when single family or single set of people are deciding policies, are uh, 
determining programs it is not on the basis of consensus that it is being done and so anything devoid of consensus and deliberation is liable to fall especially in a diverse country like india and so slowly and gradually you will see that most of the parties which do not allow the party workers to become and rise up in hierarchy on the basis of performance they eventually die and as soon as there is that there emerges a dynastic politics most you will see the decline of the party so the decline of congress party began after indira gandhi and so you can this is not this is not surprising this should not be surprising for you it also results in criminalization because if the if in important policy matters and decisions of a particular political party if the members of the political party for parties are let's say taken into account generally the normal psych dictates the common sense dictates that most of the people will not agree to in the inclusion of or para dropping of a prominent criminal into the political party it happens because all the power all the power is held with a person who is deciding everything and that person needs money that person needs muscles and so the entry of criminals within the framework of political party becomes like a parachute as easy as parachuting from uh, jet why inner party democracy should be implemented is because first and foremost every participant in democratic process has the right to be represented so what happens in usa the head of the republican party and the president of democratic party cannot decide who will be the next candidate for their party for presidential election or even the state governor election before be before you can become the candidate from your own party you will have to win the majority of votes of the registered party members of your own party and that gives everyone an opportunity so you will see when the primaries start 16 to 20 members file their candidates they carry out media wide coverage of debates so you will see you just go us presidential debates primary debates you will see that five to six people on the stage all of them from the same party not from the different party debating as to i should be the face of republican party i should be the face of democratic party there is a campaign of 4 to 5 months after that the members of the political party vote and then that person does not becomes president just the face of their own party candidate from party a and then can candidate from both the parties contest the real presidential elections it is also important for policy formulation because inner party democracy through just like we have a system to make laws and to make important decisions in the parliament if the same set of similar set of rules are implemented within the political parties that would give rise to internal debates just like we have debates within the parliament where every important position holder and most prominent members will not only participate in decision making but will express views and so that uh, policy formulation will not only be transparent but the party chiefs will also be accountable because they will know that once they go against the wishes and the will of the majority of the party members they can be voted out and so like the current president of bjp can be removed from the majority of the members who are registered as members of bjp and that induces decentralization into the party's decision making what do you mean by decentralization so a national party like bjp or congress do they have regionally varying political agendas so for example the agenda that bjp espouses at a national level is it very different from let's say up and nagaland and tamil nadu and jammu and kashmir it should be the local party members of the bjp in kerala or congress in tamil nadu to determine what should be their mainstay of the decision making in that particular state once we have inner party democracy only then we can have this situation where the remaining component of india's substantive democracy will be fulfilled india is not able to exercise its full democratic credentials for the lack of inner party democracy so as a way forward what we can do we can amend the section 29 of rpa and write there that if you want your party to be registered with election commission of india you will nom you will elect your president the manner of election of president should be determined and who will observe the election especially if it is national party it can be done by election commission of india how regularly the elections would be conducted and at what level so 
starting from district to state to national level all the levels the people who will hold the offices will be the people elected only then you will be able to solve the problem of for example women representation 50 percent of the population less than 15 percent representation in politics why do you think that happens because most of the people who call the shots are male if you allow democratic democracy within the political parties probably wouldn't even need the constitutional amendment to mandatorily provide for women reservation also the power should be given to election commission to deregister a political party in case they do not fulfill fulfill the criteria laid down by the election commission all right so we have come to the end of today's discussion we'll end with the editorial summary so you can see that mr rk raghavan has written a case diary for the indian police uh, where he talks about the dgp meet and so the three day police conference in jaipur focused on contemporary issues mainly related to information technology and and are understanding fully well how in next decade most heinous crimes are going to be committed on internet so we have already seen uh, uh, abductions happening over internet where people are just video called into uh, hiding from their family members and then ransom is asked so it's not even a physical person going and physically taking away the position of let's say a minor kidnapping him or her it's just now done on internet despite technological advancements the police abysmal public image it was agreed that police does not command a good respect among people and also the use of central police forces and central agencies has created problems in india's federal structure and so there is a need also to bridge up the gap between the senior police officers indian police service ips officers and the second and the third rung there is a huge power hierarchy which has to be bridged to allow for more efficiency how does it enables high efficiency because when you join the police service let's say in the rank of sub inspector you know that whatever how much hard you work you will never be an ips officer probably you will be a provincial police officer that too after 25 years of service so what is the motivation that you have you cannot rise up maybe you will become the station house officer or, or an sho and so that has so for example a model that can be emulated is that of a uh, england model where they have they introduced indian police service into india they got rid of that the first now everyone joins the service at the same rank and depending upon performance by the time you retire one of you will become london police commissioner which is probably the highest rank in the police service all right uh, so through this we will end the discussion and if you have any doubt you can ask me in the comment section uh i'll wait for one or two minutes but before that it's an earnest request before you leave end this video press the like button and let us know in the comment section that helps us a lot that's the way we have come so far by reading your comments and incorporating your suggestions and feedbacks into our functioning All right so if there are no more doubts we will end the session